Hello, everybody. My name is Jeremy, and you're watching The Morgue, where we put the fun back into funeral. E3 2011 is in full swing in Los Angeles this week, and although we've already seen most of the big flashy press conferences from the big names at the show, very little of it has had anything to do with MMOs just yet. I'm hoping that the few coming days will have more for us to talk about on this front and intend to dedicate next week's entire show to any pertinent information that needs to be shared with you guys. If you've been watching the coverage, feel free to hop over to jupitercolony.com where I'm sure you'll find some fellow gamers that would love to discuss the ins and outs of what's going on at E3. But as for this week's episode, we're not going to be looking to the future of gaming. In fact, we're looking to the past, to a specific facet of the MMO genre that has always had a rocky life. I'm speaking, of course, of MMO shooters. Despite this subgenre existing since the launch of World War II Online back in 2001, to date it has still not gained much of a presence within the industry as a whole. Despite the shooter genre itself having skyrocketed into the forefront of gaming as single players and console titles. Now today's show is going to focus on two primary titles that have made the name for themselves as examples within the MMO shooter genre, for better or for worse. You see, although these two titles have celebrated some form of modest success, if you can even call it that, many of the aspects of both of these titles can also be taken as examples of what not to do in modern gaming. The first of these two titles is Planetside, which although is far past its prime, is currently undergoing a sequel treatment at the hands of Sony Online Entertainment. I'll take a look at this game, do a quick review of it, and cover some of the mistakes that Sony needs to avoid in Planetside next. The second title I'd like to discuss is Hellgate London, which has been touted as perhaps one of the primary examples of how not to launch an online game. And despite the failures of its past, it has received a new lease on life at the hands of a new publisher, which will be resurrecting the title in the very near future. Each of these titles, and many of their unnamed brethren, have faced failures that have defined this subgenre. And as we take a close look at each of these titles... Perhaps we can glean a little information on just what has caused shooters to take a backseat to the MMO industry as a whole, and how developers of future titles can avoid these same pitfalls and perils. Planetside was launched by Sony Online Entertainment in 2003. The few months right after the launch were so rife with issues, ranging from imbalances among the certifications that players could undertake, to actual imbalances among the population of the three separate factions, and compounded by the many server instability issues and lag spikes that would completely cripple this action-based shooter gameplay. So many of these issues were so rampant that the game suffered an immediate and crippling loss in total subscriptions. By 2009, every one of the original six servers that the game launched with had been merged into a single server, which still felt relatively empty compared to many other online games. Now, in this little review that I'm going to be undertaking today, I will be dwelling on many of the negative aspects of this game, but I want to preface that by saying that remember this was back in 2003, where the online shooter genre practically did not exist, so the mere presence of Planetside is in itself an innovation and an evolution, and even if Sony Online Entertainment did not necessarily find the success that they expected from this game, merely the fact that they developed it was a feat in and of itself, and kudos to them for even attempting such an undertaking. Furthermore, despite the game being considered a widespread failure, it has to date been one of the most successful MMO first-person shooters ever launched. Now, that being said, success is a relative term. And when you stack up this game against the MMO landscape as a whole, it's widely considered a flop. So what exactly caused this game to fail? Well, in my opinion, it really boils down to two primary facts. The first of which, pretty simply put, is that the game was boring. And I realize that's kind of a gross overgeneralization, so I'll tell you a few of the specific gameplay mechanics that caused me to consider this a boring game to play. The core of the game focuses on the capture and hold of base stations, which are positioned around these wide open maps. As you capture and hold these individual bases, you gain influence over a particular territory and can be potentially granted new technology unlocks or buffs. Now I realize that actually that sounds like a pretty darn cool game mechanic to have in a PvP based, action based shooter, if it was a facet of the overall gameplay. But I want you to recall that that was the entirety of Planetside's gameplay. You capture and hold bases in order to capture and hold bases. There is no endgame, there is no narrative, and there is no way to win. 
Even if your faction manages to capture every single base on the entire server, the game does not end. And, bluntly, you won't be able to hold that many bases to begin with, so you're never going to be able to do that. This lack of any sort of narrative purpose or drive to actually achieve anything means that while the instant action of being able to run up to an en enemy player and shoot him in the face can sound fun for a little while, there's no real long-term goal or motivation to continue banging your head against that wall. And it's a common saying that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. In addition to the bland one-dimensionality of the actual core gameplay mechanics, there's also the world itself. These bases, all of which look identical, are dotted around landscapes that have absolutely no defining attributes, no landmarks of any kind. There are no strange outcroppings or caves to explore or anything of this nature. It's simply hills, trees, grass, occasionally a desert. Nothing worth writing home about. And all of this bland gameplay on this bland planet is meant to be driven by the fact that this is a resource battle on some sort of alien world, yet you never really get the impression that you're fighting for anything. And in fact, there's not even a reason to defend the bases that you've actually captured, and you actually gain more experience for recapturing the base after you let the enemy take it, which only further enhance the Sisyphusian nature of the whole central game concept. Now the second primary reason that I feel that Planetside did not find the success that Sony wanted it to actually comes down to money. You see, Planetside charged a box cost and a monthly subscription fee. And to a certain degree, that did make sense. It was an MMO published by an MMO game company. And at this time in the MMO industry, premium monthly subscriptions were the standard for the entire industry. However, despite being an MMO made by an MMO company, the nature of the game itself was not targeted at an MMO audience. Planetside was not a game for the people that were playing and enjoying EverQuest or World of Warcraft or Anarchy Online, although to a certain degree some of those same players probably played both. No, the core gamer that Sony should have been targeting with this was shooter fans. And in the year 2003, good online deathmatch games were already widely available with little to no cost and absolutely no online connection fee. So why? At this time, would you pay a premium monthly fee after spending your money on an initial box cost, only to go online and be bored? You see, in addition to the bland mechanics of Planetside overall, there was also extensive travel involved and very poor matchmaking systems in place. So while in Unreal Tournament or Quake, you could hop on instantly and within seconds be splattering your enemy's brains all over the nearby wall, in Planetside you never really got that option. Even their instant action PvP queue only sent you to the region where a skirmish was in progress and could sometimes require 5 minutes to 30 minutes of travel just to reach the front line of the battle. This massive disconnect between the actual gameplay and the persistence of the world that Sony was going for with the actual type of gamer that should have enjoyed that game is one of the primary things that led to its demise and something that I hope Sony is learning from as they go forward with the sequel titled Planet Side Next. Now up to this point there has been very little information released about Planet Side Next but we do know that it has not been affected by the recent round of layoffs that Sony suffered back in March of this year. Layoffs which you might recall resulted in the demise of another promising MMO shooter, The Agency. In fact, Sony released a press release not too long after those layoffs to confirm that Planetside Next was still under development and that the delay of their initial launch window, which was originally aimed for summer of 2011, has been caused by them upgrading their core engine to a new technology. Let's just hope that that new engine includes a boredom slider that they can slide to zero. The unfortunate story of Hellgate London is actually such a tragedy that I'm just going to skip to the end. The game shut down in 2009, preventing any further online play. The game could still be played in a single player mode, but after that point in time, no more multiplayer capabilities were any longer available within the US and European servers. The game continued to be functional in Eastern markets, led up by their new publisher, Handbitsoft. In 2010, Handbitsoft obtained the rights to a global distribution of the title and began making their plans to resurrect Hellgate for both American and European audiences. Which brings us up to today and the impending relaunch of this once promising title. 
This impending relaunch is actually the only reason I'm bringing it up. This is so much of a sore point in the MMO industry that just looking up the name Hellgate is bound to return results that include nothing but bad press, disappointment, and complaints. But they're warranted. The game had so many faults it was ridiculous to think that this could actually be a living product in the MMO industry. Oh, that reminds me, before I get too much into the criticism on this title, I probably should cover up front that this is not actually an MMO. As I mentioned earlier, the game functions in a single player mode, but all forms of multiplayer required a monthly subscription and connection to the publisher's servers. Now this fact caused the game to be considered an MMO shooter, but in reality, it only barely meets that qualification. There's no persistence to the world and no ongoing persistent narrative either. In fact, the lack of any form of persistent narrative is one of the primary complaints that many players of this game had when they first entered the world of Hellgate London. You see, Flagship Studios, the original developer of the title, was made up almost entirely of former employees of Blizzard North, the makers of Diablo. Expectations were high when it came to Hellgate London, not only for the gameplay itself, but for having an engaging storyline that you could actually care something about. But the game did not just disappoint on the story. When you talk about gameplay mechanics, there is in fact nothing about this game exciting or revolutionary. Most of the weaponry included in the game involves nothing more than holding down your trigger button as you spin around and occasionally point it at things that fall over. And despite the game including ragdoll physics, it did not include any sort of dramatic death animations for any of the en enemies that you went up against. But this incongruity between different features of the game doesn't end there either. There were portions of the game that seemed at times to be developed by completely different people, leading some folks that had been following the game to wonder where the leadership of the game was actually intending for this game to evolve into. And it was not uncommon for entire features or swaths of features to, when implemented, contain massive game-breaking bugs that made them impossible to actually enjoy. And as for the actual features that were included, Hellgate London launched without any form of a looking for group tool or guild support of any kind. And on top of all of these actual development failures was the engine stability itself. At the time of launch, this game could rarely be played for more than an hour before either the server disconnected you or your client crashed. But, probably the single biggest downfall of Hellgate London was actually its subscription model. While you could enjoy a single player version of the game offline, it was a little bit stripped down when it came to actually enjoying the game as a whole. And in order to enjoy the entire game as intended, you had to pay for a monthly fee in order to interact with other players. Since the box cost did not include this monthly subscription, players unwilling to pay for that subscription for a shooter experience felt left out in the cold and ignored. Meanwhile, the lack of any good solid form of social integration in the game itself left players that actually did pay for that monthly subscription feeling gypped and not getting their money's worth. In other words, if you didn't pay for it, then you couldn't play online because you couldn't connect to the servers. And if you did pay it, then you still couldn't play online because you couldn't find anybody to play with. And all of those woes over the subscription itself pale in comparison to the whole fiasco that evolved around the founder or lifetime membership program. The original cost of their lifetime membership was $150, which would have equated to 15 months of gameplay. However, the game was so much of a failure and unable to support itself that in the 10th month, the publisher announced the impending shutdown of the online multiplayer servers. And while they did stay up an additional five months after that announcement, there was no form of customer support or technical support during those remaining months. All of these development fails and all of this disappointment is an excellent example of what I'd like to call hype gone bad. You see, the game developers at Flagship Studios, many of which had actually worked on Diablo, had at numerous points during the game's development and leading up to the launch of this title, compared it to games like Half-Life, Diablo, and Guild Wars, all of which were defining games within their individual genres. Groundbreakers that redefined the way that people interacted with their stories and with their individual game mechanics. When you hear directly from the developer's mouth that was a part of one of those redefining moments in gaming that their next project is going to be even better, well, heck yeah, you're going to get a little bit excited about that, of course. So when the game finally launches and it's nothing but a pile of buggy, lazy, and incomplete features and poor implementation of the ones that are there, calling it a disappointment is a gross understatement. I firmly believe that this game could have potentially been a fine title. Maybe not a groundbreaking success or anything of that nature, but if it hadn't been talked up and portrayed as the second coming of action RPGs, 
it's possible it wouldn't have failed quite so badly. Now, I'd like to change gears a little bit here and talk about another just general topic, and that is the fact that this is the second relaunch we've seen in the recent months under a free-to-play banner of a game that had previously failed in the Western markets. Now, I mentioned in my previous episode about APB that having this as an additional option within the MMO genre could lead to players that enjoy these particular titles having more hope about the future of these underdogs. Well, I think potentially if we see this trend continuing, it could be more than just hope for players. It could also be seen as a real solid investment strategy for taking bigger risks on behalf of publishers and development houses themselves. If you end up not finding the success that you needed or wanted at the time of launch in the Western markets, it could become normal to look for an Eastern developer that would be willing to allow you to pawn that game off on them. And while you won't recoup all of your costs, just the purchase of the IP of a good title would at least leave you with more than nothing. So how about this actual relaunch? Is it going to go anywhere? Well, despite many sites around the MMO world actually talking about this relaunch pretty favorably at the moment, I actually don't see this becoming anything worth talking about over the long run for a couple reasons. One is that you can only polish a turd so much. And two is that I'm actually hearing that the T3 fund developers that are trying to relaunch this title aren't putting a whole lot of effort into it. Now, that said, merely the fact that this is a free-to-play title could alone be the savior for Hellgate London. For a couple pretty simple reasons. One is that this action first-person shooter RPG genre is very underpresented. There are very few games that can actually offer this type of gameplay. Borderlands comes to mind, but if you've already beat Borderlands a hundred times and you want to try something new, well, Hellgate's free. I've also seen it mentioned a few times still that Hellgate is like a first-person Diablo. So, as inapt as that comparison actually is, it might allow the game to leech off some of the hype that's surrounding the eventual launch of Diablo 3. And lastly, this game was developed in 2007, but even then its technology was a little old for its time, meaning that the system requirements are extremely low. I could even see this game potentially being played on mobile devices in the near future. So here we are looking back at the history of two flopped MMO first-person shooters. It's interesting to note that both of these titles have a number of similarities among them, first and most prominently being their subscription models, which simply do not match their player base. Fans of shooters can get their online jollies playing a billion different first-person shooters with no subscription fees. Charging for access puts your game at a significant disadvantage. On the other hand, the type of gamer that would swallow these subscription fees, a typical MMO gamer, is generally looking for a game with more depth than is present in most first-person shooter action games. Or to put it more simply, you're charging the wrong people for the wrong product. Now the second sad fact that both of these titles actually have in common is the fact that their social tools seem to have been added as an afterthought. If you as a developer are creating an online environment, your ability to have your players play with one another should be considered a core component of your overall gameplay experience. Things like instant matchmaking, auto-grouping, and easy social hotkeys must take the place of conversation-based grouping when your gameplay is fast-paced and action-centric, or in a word, more first-person shooter-like. Both of the above games seem to have made the assumption that their players would enjoy conversing with one another and forming bonds through everyday conversation. And while I'm sure this happened on occasion, the fact of the matter is that when you're catering your game to a shooter audience, there's a particular mindset among the people that enjoy shooting things in a video game. They don't want to talk. They want to shoot things. Now, it should be noted that future games in this genre are likely to integrate voice chat directly into the engine itself, so socialization will be less of an issue on a whole. However, the availability of auto-grouping and instant matchmaking services will always remain important. Now, the third unfortunate characteristic that these two titles both share is the shoddy implementation of features and a downright lazy development schedule. Now, to be fair, this is something that's common across game developers regardless of genre. It's not exclusive to shooters or MMO shooters for that matter. And yet it continues to astound me that given the track record of these incomplete titles, how it continues to happen on such a regular basis. On that note, I'd like to point out that I have observed more and more release and beta windows get pushed back further and further on titles across the MMO landscape. And while this does upset me a little bit as a player, I'm hoping that this indicates that each of these developers is taking more of an interest in actually getting a finished, complete, polished product out the door on the day that they launch to the public. 
Planetside and Hellgate London by no means represent the entirety of the MMO subgenre. However, unfortunately, because of their stature and their associated fall from grace, they have become a couple of the most referenced examples within this subgenre. And instead of being these shining examples that others attempt to live up to, they have instead become a stigma that future MMO first-person shooters will need to overcome in order to succeed. Before I sign off for this episode, I'm going to leave you with a smattering of information for a promising up-and-coming online shooter known as Firefall. I should note that while Red 5 Studios claims this game is not an MMO, it includes persistent worlds and characters, open-world exploration and dynamic events, and lacks any form of offline play. That sounds pretty MMO-y to me. So, check our show notes for a collection of links and information, including various trailers and gameplay demos, and a link to their official site where you can sign up for their beta, which should be starting soon if it's not already underway. I was hoping that the Firefall creators at Red 5 would have something new to show us at E3, but they instead issued a press release stating that they'd only be appearing at conventions that focused on fans and gamers. Now, since E3 is an industry-only event, they chose not to attend, and instead will only be going to conventions where they can put the game directly in the hands of the people that will probably most enjoy playing it. So, that's it for this episode of The Morgue. Be sure to keep your eyes peeled on all the E3 coverage, and if there's anything that catches your fancy, head on over to jupitercolony.com where I'm sure people would be talking all about it. That includes the stuff that's not necessarily MMO-related. For example, I've got some thoughts of my own to share on the Wii U. I'm sure you do as well. Now, next week's episode will be a recap of anything that I've managed to scrounge up from all the E3 coverage. So far, it looks like one of the top players in this year's coverage has been on live, the cloud gaming service. And while they're not specifically talking about MMOs, I may end up talking about this service as it could be a big player in the future revolution of the MMO industry as a whole. So until then, everybody, play smart and always bring your health potions. Feel free to speculate. It might have some commonality with Halo, but Blizzard has been saying that Titan is a non-IP, is a is a game not based on an existing IP. But I wouldn't be surprised if it had similarities with something existing and was called a Halo clone or something like that. They've said that also Titan will be a very casual gameplay atmosphere, and I'm starting to get the impression that it might be a shooter. I don't remember where I'm getting that impression from. So, a Halo-type-ish clone that's a new IP from Blizzard. First of all, Blizzard has a reputation for copying IPs. Um, Warcraft is just Warhammer. Um, Starcraft is something else. Oh yeah, 40k. Blizzard takes existing things, makes them better, and then releases their own thing and becomes bigger than the original ever was. That's how they do. Although, trying to be better than Halo would be a big pill to swallow.